We'll call to order the Tuesday, May 19, 2020, Sheboygan County Board of Supervisors meeting. Are we certified in compliance with the open meeting law? Yes, the agenda was posted on the 15th of May at 3.30. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Supervisor Smith. Present. Supervisor Gruber. Supervisor Schneider? Here. Supervisor Montemayor? Here. Supervisor Clark? Here. Supervisor Nelson? Here. Supervisor Prochek? Present. Supervisor Koch? Here. Supervisor Schobert? Here. Supervisor um, Bauer? Present. Supervisor Jorgensen? Here. Supervisor Liegelbauer? Here. Supervisor Nenning? Here. Supervisor Abler? Here. Supervisor Kulo? Here. Supervisor Damp. Here. Supervisor Wagner. Here. Supervisor Immel. Here. Supervisor OJ. Hello. Supervisor Hoffman. Here. Supervisor Hilbelin. Here. Supervisor Bosman. Here. Supervisor Belvin. Here. Supervisor Gary. Here. Supervisor Testrudy. Here. There are 25 supervisors present. Thank you. The next item of business is approval of the April 28th, 2020 journal. Supervisor Brower. Motion to approve. Thank you, Supervisor Brower. Supervisor Wegman. Second. Thank you, Supervisor Wegman. Is, are there any discussion? Okay. All those in favor of the April 28th journal signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Consideration of appointments by chairperson. Uh, could we, uh, we would like to approve them as listed. Is there a motion for that? Supervisor Wagner? I'll move for approval. Thank you, Supervisor Wagner. Supervisor Hibbelink? Support. Thank you, Supervisor Hibbelink. Is there any discussion? Okay, then all those in favor of the appointments by chairperson, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Next item of business is the consideration of appointments by county administrator as listed on the agenda. Is there a motion to approve these? Supervisor Emil? I'll make a motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Emil. Supervisor Nelson? I second that motion. Thank you, Supervisor Nelson. Is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of the appointments by the county administrator say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Presentation, town director from the veteran service officer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm gonna give you a quick presentation on the veteran service office. Adam asked me to keep it short, so I cut it down to 30 slides and I should have you out in about 45 minutes. If that works with you. Perfect. Uh, real quick, we can go to the next slide. Uh, I'm Todd Richter. I'm your veteran service officer. A uh, little bit of information about me. I did serve in the United States Navy and the United States Army, retiring back in 2016. I did two tours through the Persian Gulf, two tours through Iraq, and one through Afghanistan. Uh, the support staff we have is my senior benefit specialist, Craig Stewart. He's been with the county for 17 years. He was a Coast Guardsman from 97 to 2003. And just recently in the last year, we picked up Jonathan Belval, who was also a Coast Guardsman who served from 2000 to 2009. Next slide, please. As you can see, we have one of these smaller budgets in the county. Uh, we have a normal budget of 293 for the office and approximately $21,000 for our service commission. Um, we, in 2018, we brought in over $36 million of revenue 
to Sheboygan County through state and federal funds. You might be wondering why it's 2018 numbers we're showing and not 2019 due to the COVID. Normally the prior year's information is listed, but this is the most recent that they have. Next slide, please. In 2018, our veteran population was just a little over 6,900 veterans for Sheboygan County. And when you take into consideration, most of them have a spouse, we're looking at approximately 14,000 veterans and their families that we're serving. Through attrition and death, we, we lost a couple hundred veterans who went to the great beyond and we're, our last numbers that were posted were just over 6,700. So again, we're serving over 12,000 veterans and their families in Sheboygan County. Next slide. You can see the 72 counties of Wisconsin and the 11 tribes, it is a state uh, mandate and state statute that there is a county veteran service officer in every county of Wisconsin. This is actually fantastic news because there's a lot that we can do throughout the state and working with the other service officers in the other counties to help a lot of veterans. There are some states out there that do use regionalized benefits and they, they find that it's tougher to do that because of uh, travel and age and health of the veterans that they serve. Next slide, please. Quick overview of the veteran benefits. There's three pillars to veterans benefits. There's education, health, and monument services. We, we're fortunate that we have two major hospitals in Wisconsin, one being close to Milwaukee, and we have a Cleveland outpatient patient, also known as a CBOC, where we can go see our uh, primary care physician and what we like to call advanced band-aids. So if we got a cold or flu or something minor that we can just go to Cleveland and do it. Otherwise, we'll get sent to one of the VA hospitals and if they can't do it in a timely manner, under one of the new programs that came out, we can actually go to a local physician or a specialist to get the treatment at the cost to the VA. Compensation is kind of our bread and butter of what we do in our office. It comes in two forms of uh, service-connected compensation and non-service-connected. The big ones we see are the compensation that come from members of uh, the military that are injured or have some sort of injury while they're on active duty and is affecting them post-service time. Another big one that we have is our non-service-connected pension. Those are for, we generally see those in our elderly patients or our elderly veterans. Um, they're usually living at or near poverty and they um, need some extra assistance and help that the VA can give them. Uh, we do have state cemeteries that we use um, that you can pre-register so you can get your loved ones in there and minimize the effect and time that it takes to get all this to happen. And this also works on the federal level too. So if you know of any veterans out there that are thinking they may want to be buried in a veteran's cemetery, it would be good for them to get in contact with our office because we can help them with the state and federal side. GI Bill, education benefits, this is a big one. There's a lot that goes into it and these rules are always changing. So if you know of a veteran that has recently discharged or within the last 15 years, I would encourage you to have them reach out to us and find out what benefits there are. In certain scenarios, if you're service connected with a 30% uh, or higher, that will actually open up benefits to not only the veteran, but the spouse and any dependent children. And that's good for any UW school or any technical school. Next slide, please. The other facet of our office is the Veterans Service Commission. Uh, again, state statute says that every county will have one and it'll be made up of at least three uh, commissioners. Our commissioners for the county are Jennifer Sampson, she's a Navy veteran and a small business owner. Michael Berenger, Air Force veteran, and he was uh, retired from the Sheboygan Police Department due to a work-related injury. And we have Alan Knoll, and he's a uh, Vietnam era veteran. What our service commission does is pretty intricate, and at the surface, the big areas we cover are homelessness or about to be homeless, food and gas cards for those that are struggling, and some rent assistance. Over the last few months, you can imagine we haven't been that busy with the commission with all the funding that's out there, but once this comes into play and they lift more moratoriums, our office is gonna get busy with this budget. Uh, next slide, please. Some additional resources that we use, and they're not 
limited just to these resources is the Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs. They're our big state entity for veterans um, programs and affairs. One particular program we use is called the VORP program. And in a, a 10,000 foot overview, that program helps veterans that may need AOD treatment, inpatient type services, but may not be eligible for VA healthcare. And if you can believe it or not, if you know a veteran, not every veteran is eligible for VA healthcare. So then we, we lean on these other sources. A lot of community partners that we use are the Salvation Army, our local veteran service organizations, our Aging and Disability Resource Center from Sheboygan County, and Heat for Heroes. Next slide, please. Another facet that our office works in is with the Sheboygan Area Veterans Treatment Court. Um, it was actually started September 11, 2012, and that was the day that the first court was in session, and it was merely by accident that it was actually on 9-11. Uh, the team that meets weekly are all volunteers and volunteer their time to the court and its members. We, do, we meet monthly right now for our actual court session, but we meet once a week as a team to discuss the progress of the, the veterans that are in. There's multiple eligibilities, but the biggest criteria is there must be a veteran with some sort of treatable condition that we can do. Now, a treatable condition doesn't mean you have to be enrolled in VA healthcare. We are partnering with other outside agencies to try and meet the needs of the court and more importantly, meet the needs of the veteran that's struggling. We have four phases that we go through with the veterans and they're each different time frames that they have to meet certain goals and achievements in order to be eligible to move to the next phase. These, um, the veterans are actually monitored and tested based on what their needs are and why they're in court and whatever brings them to court. Next slide, please. Some of the service organizations that we use that are in the area, and some have regionalized because of the membership getting smaller and it's harder to recruit, but the, the Retired Enlisted Association is one of them, and it's self-explanatory. You have to be a retiree, and they're loosening those reins up because not everybody goes in and retires. The Veterans of Foreign Wars, uh, in order to be eligible for that, you have to actually have served in a designated area of operations, not just in support of. The American Legion, they just went through a big change when, in Congress. They actually had their charter changed, and it took a congressional body to do this. So their eligibility is essentially anybody who served from World War II to current. And then we have the disabled American veterans. Those are one of the ones that regionalized because the, the numbers are so small and you have to have some sort of disability in order to be affiliated with them. Next slide, please. One of the big things that we focus on in our office is what we're doing in the community, how we're updating the community, and what sort of outreach can we do to get this information out in the community. A couple of years ago, Craig Stewart and myself sat down and said, these benefits are changing so drastically and the word isn't getting out, so what can we do? So quarterly, we meet with all the commanders of the service organizations or their designees and go over the current issues that are changing, how they are changing, how they're affected, or who might be affected by it. We've currently been trying to get out to all the posts in, the, in Sheboygan County to do these presentations to their bodies because we don't want every member of every service organization to come to our commander's call. Otherwise, we'd be having regular service organization meetings and probably need two theaters this size to get everybody in. Community outreach, it takes many forms. One of the big things we've been able to do as of late is get out to our veterans that are either in nursing homes or has some physical difficulties or abilities to try and get to our office. So because of technology, we are able to go to the veteran and help get um, claims process move a little bit faster. Uh, next slide. And the, one of the final slides we have is, I was hoping to have a lot of information on different events going on in the county for Memorial Day, but due to COVID, everything has been canceled. Uh, next slide. And the big thing I wanna point out here is for those that don't know, because we still hear it, is that we are actually located in the Aging and Disability Resource Center in Sheboygan Falls. Uh, right now we ask that if you have an issue that you please call. 
If it's an emergent issue, we'll get you in and we'll keep you safe and we'll work the problem. Otherwise, we're trying to do it by email, fax, snail mail, any way we can be effective and get it done. But if it's a time sensitive matter, we definitely want to get you in the office so we can get the service that you need. Pending any questions, that is my 45 minute presentation. All right, thank you. Thank you, Todd. Um, public addresses for this evening? Uh, we have one of James Goldbeck from Sheboygan. Come on up. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit here and then I'm going to add a little, little bit since it's changed, okay? Uh, yesterday, I was contacted by many friends, neighbors, and business associates in regards to Sheboygan County passing legislation that would declare a state emergency in Sheboygan County. Uh, this raises some serious concerns to Sheboygan County residents and our businesses. Uh, as you know, uh, with our on March 12, 2020, Governor Evers, on behalf of the state of Wisconsin, declared the existence of a public health emergency known as COVID-19 now, and the order was issued and referred to as a stay-at-home order. This caused this order was originated from empirical data modeling that was supported and promoted by the World Health Organization. As we know now and are continuing to learn, the data modeling was greatly inaccurate, so much that President Trump uh, has halted funding to the WHO in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, furthermore, the stay-at-home order by Governor Evers expired and additional measure, measures attempted were struck down by the Supreme Court, ultimately lifting the stay-at-home order and ending the state of emergency as it is. At this time, there is no state of emergency as it relates to the COVID-19 in Wisconsin. As of May 14, 2020, Wisconsin had 11,275 confirmed cases. Sheboygan County had 70 confirmed cases with 10 still active, and there were three reported deaths. The population of Sheboygan County is 115,340, according to the U.S. Census. So this is... This is very important. According to the census, 70 cases thus far would represent 0 .0006 of the population is being confirmed to have had the virus known as COVID-19. Three deaths is three too many for any reason. However, that is 0.00002% of the population. So at what point do we all agree that the cure cannot be worse than the disease? Our residents' mental health should be of our primary concern after viewing the data. The suicide rate has nearly doubled during this pandemic, and further mental illness is spreading at a rapid pace, not including drug overdoses. Not being able to exercise, seek preventative treatment, social engagement, and day-to-day -day routines to keep us in good health were freedoms and established rights suspended during this crisis. The crisis is over, at least for now. There's no question that the data is flawed. We must ask our representatives and community leaders to use good judgment, hold community discussions, and do not force the state of fear or panic as we move forward. I'm going to be very transparent. There is no state of emergency in Sheboygan, and any legislation which would suggest otherwise, I implore you to vote no, because it does not align with the best interests of our residents and businesses. Frankly, I'm very disappointed that we would promote a state of emergency in our county when there is none present, and that has been clearly defined by law. I question as to where our leaders are getting their information and to how they are processing it. And Chairman, what I'm requesting is that, what, Chairman, what you are requesting is the unilateral and blanket authority for emergency that doesn't exist. And I encourage you to focus on the well-being of our residents and our businesses and to be an advocate for Sheboygan County residents. We will find out in the next couple of weeks how we as a population are truly impacted by COVID-19 since the incubation period falls within that timeline. Until then, I implore you to think about the mental health of our community and the great danger of spreading fear by enacting a state of emergency in Sheboygan County when one does not exist. And what I'd like to add, Liv, is I have a marketing agency and what we do a lot, 90% of my day is spent in Excel sheets. So all the data, everything that you read, I've gone through the data. I've ran the data myself and the data it's, itself is flawed even how it is stipulated. Pneumonia has dropped off the charts, and in place of it has come COVID-19. 
And thank you very much. So I believe there is definitely a misclassification. And if any of you have looked up the classifications for which diagnose it, if you went into the emergency room with a shortness of breath, just came to you today, you would then be classified as COVID-19. If you had just a fever, normally you normally take some aspirin for something like that and relax, you'd be fine. But now you'd be classified as COVID-19. So we don't really have a great way to track this, measure it, um, and to classify appropriately because this is, this is new COVID-19, but it's not new from the flu and, and the pandemic and the strains where this originated from. We were told that this was gonna be a 4% uh, mortality rate and it is not even close. And us today, we sit here with these masks on right now, but I don't know how many of you actually know these masks actually do no good whatsoever. They prevent nothing at all. Dr. Fauci has even said and gone on record in 60 minutes that there's no reason to wear a mask. So I want you all to think about it. There's unintended consequences from the actions that we take, including these masks. Every single one of us right now are breathing carbon monoxide. And we know that's bad and it's horrible for our system. But in turn, we're doing it. All right. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next item of business is letter communications and announcements. Uh, there's one item from Portage County, and it is just notice that their non-binding referendum on the April ballot regarding redistricting maps uh, be drawn nonpartisan was passed. Thank you, we'll accept that for information, seeing as how that's been something we've dealt with a number of times in the past. Governor Administrator's Report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. When I was with you a month ago, I gave you an update of what the county had been doing over the last six weeks. You'll be pleased to know that tonight I'm just going to be talking about the last week. <laughs> Setting the stage, the Public Health uh, Division put out their daily update today. The Wisconsin confirmed cases for uh, COVID-19, we have 12,885. In Sheboygan County, a total confirmed case of 72, five active, 64 recovered, three individuals that have passed away, and we've done a total of 2,103, or we have a total of 2,103 tests. Of course, we have a population of about 117,000. So I think most people recognize we need to do far more testing in Sheboygan County throughout the state, throughout the country. And unfortunately, that's not happening to the extent that we need to do so. I am so pleased with the work that our community has done. Since you put the county state of emergency in a couple of months ago, and since we work collectively in collaboration as a county, a state, a country, following uh, federal guidance, state guidance, our public health guidance, we have really done a remarkable job holding the line on positive cases. We've never had more than 20 positive cases over the course of the last two months, and again, today we're at five. So that's a real credit to our community as a whole. And it's one of the reasons why uh, we came out with guidelines or recommendations rather than orders, but I'll touch on that more in a moment. But I'm so pleased with the work that our community has done. Statewide, we've seen 459 deaths and across the United States, we've seen 91,582. And we all know that's gonna continue to increase. The past few days have been a whirlwind, and uh, when the Supreme Court took its action on May 13th, I think for many of us it was disappointing on a larger scale that the state couldn't work in collaboration to have clear guidance. Uh, leadership struggled, whether Republican or Democrat, to come together and provide clear guidance and speak with one voice. And during a health pandemic, you'd like to think that could happen. It didn't. We anticipated the possibility that state guidance would change or that the state would drop the ball in the laps of local units of government across the state. And so we were preparing or started preparing the week before on guidelines because we anticipated that would probably be the most appropriate way to proceed, particularly with the excellent job we've been doing as a community as businesses, as individuals, holding the line on positive cases and acting appropriately to safeguard ourselves and our neighbors and friends. 
So when the Sup Supreme Court took action or ruled on May 13th, it was just 24 hours later that we distributed a news release to the community saying that we would be sharing Safe Start recommendations the following day, but that as a result of the good work in this community, we would not be issuing any order to direct how businesses or organizations operate. And immediately, I think there was a fair amount of appreciation for that guidance because our phones were ringing off the hooks. What's the county going to do? Are they going to extend the order like some of the other counties did? What are we going to do? And we very quickly told the community, no, that's not our plan. We'll be coming out with guidance. So I, I think we all know in this room how important it is that we lead and that we focus on the facts and that we try to address uncertainty as much as possible. And so I was so pleased within 24 hours we said we would not put, be putting an order in place. The next day, we delivered as promised. We provided Sheboygan County Safe Restart Guidelines and Recommendations for Action. Not an order, not requirements. In fact, they can't be enforced. They're guidelines, they're recommendations. And the feedback was very positive. I don't know about you, but I received a lot of positive accolades from businesses, owners, and others. Thank you for the guidelines. Thanks to you for the approach you're taking. In fact, State Representative Terry Kotzman included in his update that he appreciated and gave a shout out to Sheboygan County for the approach we took, how decisively we reached out to the community, and that we took the appro appropriate approach of guidelines. Some of the other counties in the state that have more positive cases than, I, than we do uh, put orders in place and subsequently rescinded them because of some of the uncertainty of, well, what did the Supreme Court order mean for state public health versus local public health officers? Again, kind of led to more uncertainty and angst in their communities. I really think we took the right approach. We're relying on individual responsibility. We're relying on businesses and community leaders and everyone in this room, everyone in Sheboygan County, to be mindful of their health and their neighbors and their friends and the people they interact with. That's what we're doing. And I really think most people are going to be mindful. Our veteran service officer was just up here talking about our veterans, and I thought, you know, how appropriate. Many of them gave the ultimate sacrifice in times of need. Spent Lord knows how many months, years, away from their family and friends because of service above self, protecting their community. We've been in this battle for 60 days. And a lot of people have passed away. 60 days. Feels longer. Sometimes I wonder how our veterans look at this from a standpoint of the sacrifices and what they did for, the, for their country. Well, it's just interesting to think about. As Todd mentioned, they, on them, they themselves are, have already taken action to cancel some events. We didn't direct that. Veterans organizations are doing that on their own. I wonder why. Because they know the pandemic's not over. And because they know if people start congregating in large groups, we're probably going to see a spike in COVID and people are going to get sick and some people are going to die. So I compliment them for their leadership and being mindful of others. So we put these guidelines out and again, the feedback's been positive. Within it, we talk about cases and that the fact that they're going down certainly have been steady in Sheboygan County, which is wonderful, but going, uh, seeing a trend in the state where we're flattening that curve. Testing continues to be a problem. This actually frustrates me that we're not where we need to be with testing. We can better manage the situation and give people peace of mind the more we can test. We can get people back into the workforce more the more we can test. We need to do more testing. And we're not where, we're, we're not where the President of the United States or other leaders are saying anyone can get a test anytime they want. We're not there yet. And we have one hospital or one public 
health provider providing criteria and testing that may be more broad or open than another. We're not where we need to be there yet. We need to improve. Certainly our hospitals are in a much better position to help people in need, much better position. And personal protective equipment, which the county has really taken a strong leadership role in providing and coordinating, we're in much better position there as well. But not ideal. We're in that eight to 28 day range, not a month or more. And anyone who is a direct care provider, you know personally how important that personal protective equipment is and how quickly you go through it. If you're in a nursing home or assisted living facility or hospital or facility where you need that. Emergency responders and health care providers have died in this country helping people in need because of COVID. Don't tell me it's not serious. And of course, tracing is so important, contact tracing. We have to be able to do that effectively. And fortunately, our public health department has beefed that up a little bit from eight employees to 12 employees. We've hired some limited term employees. That's getting better. In fact, it's pretty strong right now, and I hope it stays that way. So we've done some good things. And we need to continue to be mindful and vigilant and encourage the community to seriously consider these guidelines and make individual decisions, business by business decisions on what they can do to protect their staff and customers alike. So that was last week. It was last week, Thursday, Friday. Here we are to this evening. And we um, decide to extend or suggest to extend the ex uh, state of emergency in Sheboygan County. And I know that that's probably not the best title. I agree. I agree. When we put this in place two months ago, almost exactly what you have before you tonight, uh, I think it was unanimous in this room, and I don't think we heard a peep from anyone in the community about it. In fact, my bet is most people in the community didn't even know you put in a county emergency order. I think what happened in the last 24 hours is after the Supreme Court action and all the focus on the uh, orders to stay at home, all of a sudden, the, the, the community, some members of the community see this about, oh, we're extending something, potentially 60 days. Uh-oh, are they putting in a stay-at-home order here or a safer-at-home order here? Are they once again not going to let businesses open? Couldn't be farther from the truth. We all know that in this room. Many people in the community know it. And I can assure you, of all the people that called me and emailed me yesterday, and there were a lot, and I know you dealt with this as well, in just about every single instance when I forwarded them the explanation for what it is we're doing and why, almost in every instance, I got a response saying, thank you, makes sense, keep up the good work. It's an opportunity to explain some information. So why is this extension important. We're still in the midst of a health pandemic. It doesn't stop at the county line. It's still happening across the country. I don't think there's I don't think there's a downside in making sure that community continues to be aware we have health crisis going on with COVID-19 and we've yet to come up with a final solution. We need to be vigilant. One of the reasons we initially passed the emergency, county emergency, declaration of emergency, is it makes us eligible for state and federal funding. Pretty important. We're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars responding to COVID-19 and the state of emergency, the county state of emergency, makes us eligible to continue to receive that reimbursement. I am not 100% certain passing it again does that. We passed it once. But based on what happens at the state and federal level, I think I'd rather err on the side of having it in place and making sure that we're eligible for those funds. It authorizes the county administrator to make expenditures as necessary for the health, safety, protection, and welfare of the community. For example, purchasing uh, personal protective equipment. Through your authority and support, we have purchased $100,000 of personal protective equipment. We gave our CNAs at Rocky Knoll a dollar 
an hour increase so we could fill 10, 12 positions before we saw potentially a surge there. We have made other benefit changes. We hired some LTEs to do contact tag tracing at uh, public health, for example. So at this point, we've spent $300,000 of the $500,000 range that you provided two months ago. And what you have before you tonight is the same number. We're not talking about another 500000 It's the same aggregate number. So we would have $200,000 of flexibility to continue to purchase things probably like personal protective equipment. If we have one nursing home or one assisted living facility get hammered, it's going to require a lot of personal protective equipment. And I just know our emergency management director is going to be involved with helping with that. It acknowledges the county board's support for the Sheboygan County Safe Restart recommendations, guidelines. It acknowledges your support. Those guidelines can't be enforced. They're recommendations. And then finally, if, if in the event we experience a surge in COVID-19, if our hospitals get overrun, let's be prepared. Let's be poised to respond as quickly as possible. Been working for you for 21 years. I'm not going to start making rash decisions or doing something unusual. But if we need personal protective equipment or we need LTEs or we need to make some changes, I don't want to go to the HR committee and the finance committee and the executive committee and pull a county board meeting together. I'm going to keep all those folks informed as I have been, but it allows us to respond more quickly as needed, if it's needed. I want to thank and acknowledge uh, Chairman Koch and certainly uh, Supervisor Roger Destruti. You have an amendment before you. And as I look in the mirror and think about where we're at and what's happened in the last 24 hours, I personally accept some responsibility that this resolution could have been clearer. You know, no one looked at it two months ago in the community and had any issue with it. But now, after the Supreme Court action, I can see where people are looking at it very carefully. And I, I get that. I understand that. But it's to do what I just laid out. But Roger Destruti suggested that we just absolutely clarify up front that this resolution is intended to support the reopening of businesses, nonprofits, and other facilities that are open to the public. This resolution does not reinstate Governor, safer, Governor Evers' safer at home order or include any other new orders or restrictions on individuals, businesses, or community activities. This resolution supports the county administrator and other departments and responding to unanticipated surges in COVID-19, if needed, if needed. And again, the extension of the state of the emergency in Sheboygan County is not intended to cur curtail any business, church, or community activity. As I said, anyone that I talked to yesterday or sent clarification to, they responded favorably. We all have a job going for. That's what we're doing right now. So as we consider this this evening, I think we need to think a little bit about service above self and the fact that we're 60 days into this and this is impacting a lot of people. We need to open up. We need to get our economy going. But let's focus on individual responsibility, people being mindful of one another and just and not send the message that this is over and we're out of the woods. That's not the right message to send. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, resolutions introduced. Resolution number one from County Board Chairperson Vernon Koch. Regarding extending state of emergency in Sheboygan County. Contemplated action pursuant to Rule 13 it is anticipated that a motion to withdraw or pull this proposal resolution will be made. If by majority vote the board, boards to pull this resolution, it will be subject to immediate action. Um, at Mr. Koch's request, I'm looking for a motion to pull this. Supervisor Wagner. I move that. 
Supervisor Hoffman. I second that motion. Uh, we will vote on that, yep. and that vote is non debatable. All right, Supervisor Smith. Supervisor Gruber? Yes. Supervisor Schneider? Yes. Supervisor Montemayor? Tell me what this means. That we're pulling something. Yeah. <coughs> I can't answer that. So one of the, the processes we have at the county board level is when a resolution is introduced, it is by chapter two of the county code referred to a committee. The motion to pull allows the county board to act immediately on it at this meeting as opposed to referring it, it to a committee. Thank you. Hi. Wait, point of question again. So it's gonna get it's gonna get debated tonight. Is that what is that saying? So something's gonna happen on it tonight? Yes. And it's a it's just a simple majority? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Montemayor? Yes. Yes. Supervisor Clark? Yes. Supervisor Nelson? No. Supervisor Krawcheck? Yes. Supervisor Koch? Yes. Supervisor Schobert? Yes. Supervisor Brower? Yes. Supervisor Jorgensen? No. Supervisor Ziegelbauer? Yes. Supervisor Nenick? Yes. Supervisor Abler? Yes. Supervisor Kulo? Yes. Supervisor Dan? Yes. Supervisor Wagner? Yes. Supervisor Kimmel? No. Supervisor OJ? Aye. Supervisor Hoffman? Aye. Supervisor Hilboing? No. Supervisor Bosman? Yes. Supervisor Veldman? Yes. Supervisor Gehring? Aye. Supervisor Testrudy? Aye. Motion to poll is approved 21 to 4. I, I would like to change my no. I misunderstood it. I would like to change it to no. I know it doesn't change the majority, but okay. apologies. to approve. Supervisor uh, Adler. I make a motion to approve. Supervisor Kulo. Yeah. And this is debatable. We vote on this first? No, we discuss. We discuss. Yeah. Is there any discussion? Supervisor Testrudy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I would like to offer a friendly amendment as described and uh, mentioned by, uh, by Mr. King and his uh, sheet that's been handed out. And this, these bullet points were the four questions that I answered to people that had concerns when they read, read the resolution. Some of the people at the first time they read a county resolution because the world goes along and all is well, they don't get to when it affects their life, they look more closely. They saw the, the, the title of the resolution. They were confused. They didn't understand. This amendment is to clarify some of those four points that came up with the people that I talked to. Is there a second on this amendment? Supervisor Hoffman. I so second. And we need to vote on the amendment, correct? Or more discussion. Or more discussion. Supervisor Smith. Uh, I still think it remains pretty vague. What's, what classifies a surge in COVID-19 cases? And who gets, to this, who gets to determine what that surge looks like and what, how does it get quantified? Thank you for raising that question. I was going to touch on that during my remarks. I do not see uh, a surge as all of a sudden positive cases going up, uh, whether it's doubling or tripling. I mean, our numbers are really in check right now. We've been holding our own well. What I would envision as a serious problem where we might have to uh, look at additional approaches is if our hospitals are overrun. So I would see a surge in COVID is if our hospitals are overrun and unable to manage uh, the, the care that they need to provide. So, so, I, I'm, I'm there. I, so if that state of emergency goes into effect, who determines that the hospitals are now going to be overrun? And then what steps does the county board then take 
if, this, if that situation occurs, what happens then? The Mr. public Chairman, health. Did everybody hear the question? Order. We should be discussing the amendment, not the motion itself. Right now. Yeah. Uh, th my question stems from the motion, uh, from the amendment. I'm questioning the, the terminology in the, in the amendment. Which is I, I leave it up to him to decide. I just <laughs> Public health has been doing an outstanding job. I haven't heard anybody in this room say they haven't been doing an outstanding job. I haven't heard anybody in this community say they haven't been doing an outstanding job. Uh, they are working very closely with the hospitals and all the health care providers on monitoring this and managing this and working in collaboration. Uh, as soon as they sense or hear or know that we're seeing a surge of such an extent that our hospitals and healthcare providers and emergency responders are being overrun. All of us in this room are gonna know it. The community is gonna know it. And public health has responsibility under state statutes to help manage that situation. But I anticipate that if we get to that point, I think that the full board is gonna be weighing in it if we have to do anything different than guidelines. My hope is that situation never occurs and these guidelines will be more than sufficient. And would it be prudent to vote on the resolution in the, at that time when that becomes an issue, as opposed to stating the state of emergency now? <laughs> I'm going to step away because you're, you're discussing an amendment. Yeah. Supervisor Nelson. I just want to uh, compliment the uh, people that were responsible for this amendment because it vastly clarifies uh, certain parts of the resolution. Any questions? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. It's OG back here. Yeah, I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I would just like to remind everyone, especially the, the new members of the board, whereas clauses have no teeth. We can say whatever we want in the whereas is. What matters is the therefores that come after them. So this, while it, it, it can be good to explain to people, can't be used to say you did, you can't do this because this is telling us you can't. The whereas is just don't have that authority. Thank you, Supervisor OJ. Supervisor Emma? I don't know if I, I have a letter to read, but I don't know if it's appropriate to wait, do it now or wait until the next discussion. Mm -hmm. no. yeah, I don't have to wait for that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Supervisor Dan. We would like to have the person that's speaking determine whether or not they have the authority to do it. Supervisor Smith, on the amendment to, to the resolution. The vote on the amendment. Oh, no. No. Supervisor Gruber. Yes. Supervisor Schneider. Yes. Supervisor Montemayor. Yes. Supervisor Clark. Yes. Supervisor Nelson. Yes. Supervisor Kocek. Yes. Supervisor Koch. Yes. Supervisor Schneider. <laughs> yes. Supervisor Brower? Yes. Supervisor Jorgensen? Yes. Supervisor Giebelbauer? Yes. Supervisor Nanik? Yes. Supervisor Adler? Yes. Supervisor Kulo? Yes. Supervisor Gam? Yes. Supervisor Wagner? Yes. Supervisor Kimmel? No. Supervisor OJ? Aye. Supervisor Hoffman? Aye. Supervisor Hobelink? Yes. Supervisor Bosman? Aye. Supervisor Veldman? Aye. Supervisor Guerin? Aye. Supervisor Castridi? Aye. That motion passes. Now we are looking for a motion to approve as amended.
discussion on the main motion. Supervisor OJ. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be voting against this, which I feel kind of weird about. But two months ago, we didn't know what was happening. We didn't know what was going on. Um, now our state isn't in a state of emergency, so unfortunately the, the language of state of emergency um, troubles me. And guidance, as Adam was talking about, guidance doesn't require a state of emergency. We can give the community that guidance without having it, that state of emergency declared. My question would be, what does a state of emergency give us that we otherwise wouldn't have? And I'm not talking about, well, it's more convenient if we have a state of emergency. What things are triggered by a state of emergency that we don't have access or the ability to do without it? And then the, the last point I want to make is we keep talking about we're not doing a stay-at-home order, but the last, therefore be it resolved, from what I understand and from looking at what Chapter 252 of the statutes actually says, would give, the way we have it worded, the um, local public health officer the ability to do that without coming to us and to me, a stay-at-home order is a very political decision. Anything that affects people's lives to that degree, while well, maybe public health is also very political. And at that point, I wouldn't be able to tell people, we didn't do it, because by this action, at some point, if the doubling of cases, if all of a sudden we have 10 active cases, is that a surge? I don't know. Who gets to decide that? is it wouldn't be coming to us. This clearly gives the pu local public health official the ability to enact things according to Chapter 252, which does include stay at home. So that's my issue. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? No. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. There was really two parts to your question as I understood it. The first was, what do we gain by adopting a, an extension to the state of emergency? And I think your county administrator outlined some of those things. What it really does is it allows the county, um, through the county administrator, to react quickly to a change in circumstances that might arise, or a surge as we're referring to it as. And normally we have our processes that require committee um, approval for certain actions. Normally, if there was an addition to Health and Human Services, the LTEs that are added on, normally that's something that would be run through the HR committee, for example. So it, it is allowing us to um, take action more quickly in the event that it's necessary and seen as a benefit to the public good uh, for the health and safety of the residents of Sheboygan County. So there is a lot of discretion left to the county administrator in making that determination. And as your county administrator mentioned, this has been in place for, for 60 days. And so I think at this point, you probably have a flavor of some of the types of actions that are being taken um, pursuant to that state of emergency authority. And the, the second part of it, as I understood the question, related to the public health officer and the, and the safer at home. And we do have the Supreme Court decision that outlines the, the trouble with the safer at home order as the court saw it. Um, and that was part of Chapter 252. So there is language in your resolution tonight that shows that the county board is in support of, of the local public health officer. But it's different at the county level than at the state level. And our local public health officer has rights um, and, and certain authority given to her under Chapter 252 that are independent of the county board. So with the Supreme Court decision, we saw a discussion on rulemaking in Chapter 227 and how the legislature needed to be involved in that decision to issue the Safer at Home order. Um, certainly that's not something that's being discussed at the county level at this point, but there are independent authority, there is, uh, that the public health officer does have under Chapter 
252 and, and certainly she's been working closely with other county um, officials and county leadership to make sure that everybody's informed about any actions that public health will be taking. So if there's further questions, let me know. By not passing this, I don't think that negatively impacts our ability to, to purchase testing kits or do more testing. Though, if we had a situation where we hit a, a huge spike, you know, again, God forbid, if something happened that none of us are anticipating, don't want to see happen, but if that happens and we have to purchase more test kits or we have to pull the staff together needed to administer the test or respond to a situation. This provides greater discretion for that to happen. This allows us to respond more quickly. Supervisor Distributi. Uh, I'd like to address uh, Supervisor OJ's point. If it would feel uh, more, everyone would feel more comfortable, is it possible to have give that authority to the executive committee to act on Adam's recommendations. I believe they would have the ability to call an emergency 24-hour meeting. And would that, uh, would that be something that could possibly uh, be put in this resolution to uh, put at ease more people that we could get the support of them? So the, the authority that the county board is considering granting under Chapter 15 of the county code is part of your county code, and it is designating the county administrator as the individual who has the authority to make these decisions. I think that, that so far the county administrator has been working closely with the executive committee and keeping them informed and looking to um, have some direction from them as far as some of the decisions that he's been making. But a short answer to your question is we would need an, an ordinance amending the county code to add that authority for the executive committee. <coughs> Certainly um, your county administrator can, can speak more to the uh, open communication between the executive committee and, and the administrator's office but we would need an amendment to the county code through an ordinance to actually affect that change. Supervisor Smith. Uh, following that point from Supervisor Distributing, would, would we be allowed to do 15.11 under Section C in our chapter, which would just give the chair, uh, chairman the authority for that 24-hour meeting? So at what time, like, so at that point, like, let's say that we are in that state of emergency and we need to enact a resolution, like a state of, like a state of emergency, why couldn't we just put in place in this resolution all the get rid of all the other language and just put in the fact that we support a, the chairman having the right to have the chapter 1511 that allows us to get a call a meeting 24 hours and then we can go and discuss the re a resolution that, that would be similar to like, this, like a state of emergency one. So I still I kind of have the same question as I did before and I know it wasn't recognized. Why are we declaring a state of emergency when we are not doing one? So I mean I think that's the, the I would be comfortable I would be comfortable putting in a 24-hour meeting notice to discuss a resolution to discuss whether we should be in a state of emergency. Is that, am I or am I reading that completely wrong? Is that what that 1511 says? The I would print it off if you want to read it, Crystal.
thank you for providing me a copy of chapter 15. Um, and I had a hard time hearing you through the podium. So maybe you could repeat well, your question. Is, is, if, that, if that 1511, if I'm reading that correctly or if I'm understanding it correctly, that would give the chairman the authority to call a 24-hour meeting at what time we could discuss a resolution if we were in a situation where COVID had flared up beyond what we anticipated being. And then at that point, we could discuss uh, being in a state of emergency and then providing the, the types of things that we're talking about now. So for those of you who may not have heard, the question really is, can we rely on 15.11 of the county code to call a meeting upon 24 hours to at that point consider a resolution related to the declaration of a state of emergency? Under the Wisconsin statutes, we always have the ability upon 24 hours notice of posting the, the nature of the, the meeting to have a meeting of the county board. Certainly your county board chairperson um, has the ability to call a special meeting. We don't necessarily need to rely on the authority in chapter 15 for that. So while I, I see that there is some language in chapter 15, there's also independent authority to call a special meeting to take up certain issues. So again, as I understand it then, why do we need to, to address this now if it's not an issue now? Why couldn't we wait till we're in a situation where we need to pass something like this and then call a meeting at that point and then, and then discuss? 1511 specifically to declare a emergency, but not represent. We can't be discussing with the gallery. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm not sure if that question is to me. I mean, I guess it's to anyone who has an answer. I mean, are we, do you have the authority to call a 24 hour meeting, Chairman Koch? I do. But I think that at if there is a surge, how many people here could be infected, either directly or indirectly? How many people would be able to get show up? Could we even have a quorum? We don't know that. Yeah. So I would rather, to me, preparing to fail is not the answer. You know, there are Failure to prepare to conferences. I've been on several meetings uh, through, my, through my job, the meeting with town boards, meeting with village boards, <coughs> all via teleconference. There's no reason why we couldn't establish something like that if we were in a state of emergency. We could do a teleconference. We could do a Zoom meeting. We could do a Teams meeting. There's, there's, we don't have to be physically here to, to speak with each other and communicate with each other. My concern is it's just that the state of emergency just flings a lot of power. There's a lot of language in that 252. There's a lot of language in that Wisconsin statute 323 that's very concerning. And it's, it's not something that I want to just hand over to every single constituent I talk to and email with had that exact concern. And I understand uh, County Administrator Payne's point where it's not something we'd act rash, like it wouldn't be a rash decision. But the second we hand that over, it can be a decision that can be made. And I just, I, I would be, I feel much more comfortable, my constituents feel much more comfortable if we just waited for that surge to be more prevalent. Where right now we have five active cases. And I just don't see the state of emergency as, as it's stated in the, in the resolution. Supervisor Emil. Yeah, I just want to echo a little bit about that. I, I received the letter. I, I guess I won't read the whole letter just for sake of time, but from a, a county constituent, uh, Mr. Johnson from Fuller, and uh, he brings up a good point, and I've heard this from several constituents as well. Uh, in the original order, paragraph three, uh, it says, if this does not occur and we experience a surge of cases, Sheboygan County will need to order stronger restrictions. I, I know we talked about this a little bit, but what metrics would determine the spike? Who makes the decisions? What restrictions would be implemented? You know, that's, um, yeah, that's uh, a big thing that I just heard from a lot of constituents is uh, uh, what metrics would determine that? What would constitute a spike? And I guess that's a big question, but um, just concerned about that. that I have heard from constituents who are very much concerned about the lifting of the Supreme, or the Supreme Court's action from the state um, about uh, 
lifting the Safer at Home directive or order, um, that people are very much concerned about the, the cases that could be that aren't being tested. I do sit in on the Monday morning uh, public health meetings that are at 7.30 on every Monday morning where we go through the discussions about PPE, we go through the discussions about what's happening in the communities. We are talking about uh, the lack of testing that is in the community right now that I'm hearing it from directly from physicians in this area that are very concerned about the inability to get adequate testing. And that is a true, a true concern. So I also sit just newly on the Health and Human Services Commission uh, or committee, I don't know always the right words. Um, and I know for a fact through that how hard people are working to make sure that they are making sound decisions without, without affecting negatively uh, businesses. My role, uh, previous role as the director of senior services for the city of Sheboygan, my constituents and my participants at the senior center are the most vulnerable people in the county. And we have over 9,000 older adults, 65 and older, in, in, the count, in the city of Sheboygan, not just the county. We have an aging population. I have a, a direct response and concern for the very people that we serve in that and looking to make sure that they are safe with regards to our neighbors. So I understand that business has been affected negatively. I understand that tremendously. We're concerned about that in all ways. I don't feel that, or think, I should say, that this, this, this um, order or guidance is going to, to harm anyone in the sense of we're not stopping businesses. It allows people to act quickly. If you've paid attention to what happened at Sunny Ridge, those, that was something that happened quickly, that response that could happen quickly saved people. And I'm profoundly concerned about the lack of concern for people who are elderly. We have a right and we serve people, and I'll even speak to um, Supervisor Immel, who serves on the Board of Generations. We're concerned about elderly individuals. And we have a great deal of those individuals in our community. So what I'm trying to say is that there's two sides to this. It is business, but it's also life. And you don't get your life back. You can work for your business back, but you don't get your life back. That's all I'm saying. Supervisor Hibbley. Um, so, so much of the feedback I received from constituents was even after I explained, and I appreciate my conversation with Adam, it brought me some clarity on some of the fine points in, in what we're doing here. And I appreciated that. I appreciate uh, uh, Mr. Distribute's amendment as it does make it very clear what we're doing. The problem is the fear is out in the bay already. And there's a lot of people, <coughs> who, a lot of the feedback I received was, I don't want to open my business. And then in two weeks, I have to let everyone go again because cases have gone up. There's just that little bit of a specter hanging over this. Frankly, people are sick of being imposed upon having to stay home. I understand the health concerns. I understand uh, Adam's point about staying in line for state and federal dollars. I understand all of it. It's just, unfortunately, due to really nobody's fault, just probably bad communication in terms of the original releases. Fear is kind of out that we may be doing something that could close businesses again. The only thing, and this kind of came to me as I was sitting here thinking, could we extend this 30 days instead of another 60 and revisit it in 30 days? That might be a compromise that we could all live with. I, I, I appreciate the concern about the elderly. Um, a lot of things have happened with how we shop now. Um, Mr. Nelson and I were talking about the fact they're enjoying very much being able to just pick up their food at the grocery store now after they've ordered. There's a lot of things that have happened to make this probably a lot safer for, for the elderly amongst us. I am, I do have a bigger concern. I, I don't think working to get a business back is as easy as everyone thinks it is. A lot of dollars were spent maybe employing people for a while and then they had to be released in the end. I just really feel like we have to either say no to this or shorten the line. Can be sure that it wouldn't be another amendment of the motion, right? Mm -hmm. Very good. Are you 
Is that a motion that you're making? I would, make that, I would make that a motion, yes. Supervisor Nelson? Well, um, first, is there a second on that motion? To shorten it. Supervisor Gruber, second? Now, that is under discussion. The amendment of shortening it to 30 days. Supervisor Jorgensen. I have a question. I wasn't here. I was out of town for the prior discussion, so I'm repeating something. I apologize. Um, but just as clarification for what can occur under this section 1511 we were talking about before, but now I'm referring to section 1512 because it kind of relates to what he's saying. In there it says that the duration of a state of emergency shall not exceed 60 days as to an emergency resulting from enemy action, or 30 days as to emergencies resulting from natural or man-made disaster. How did we get to 60 days as our standard is my question, and I'm sure somebody's got an answer for it, but that's just what I want to ask at this point in time based on what is being proposed. And I, I'm aware of the, the language in the code that you're referring to. And I think that those are very defined terms. Clearly, we don't have any enemy action here. Um, and I think it's, it's less clear whether this is a, a, some sort of disaster situation. And so my interpretation of that is that we don't have, we're not falling into any of those categories. What we have is a really unique situation, um, a novel virus that's entered our community. And so therefore, we don't have any of those um, applicable limits that are listed in that statute. Uh, the, the statutes themselves say that the authority comes from um, the projected amount of time that we can anticipate that this might last in the community. I would also remind the board that you do have the ability to rescind this as well. So at the next county board meeting, um, you do have the ability, if it's on the agenda, of course, to take um, action to modify the order if that's appropriate. Um, so it can be of a, of a length of time under state law that we expect this situation will continue. So did I understand you to say that we are not operating under 15 when we do this? We are, we are operating under Chapter 15. Those specific time limits that you referenced, um, in my opinion, are not applicable to our COVID-19 situation. Supervisor Nelson? Well, if I understand the procedure so far, we're going to be voting on the amendment to make it from 60 to 30 days, is that correct? That is correct. And I think that's a, immaterial to the people of, uh, of our, our county. Uh, how can I say this? The cat is out of the bag. They, they does it 30 days, 60 days. The, the fear, the fear of, uh, is trumping the, the facts in some ways. And so, uh, quite frankly, if it's going to be anything, it might as well be the 60 days because, uh, uh, and unfortunately, words have power, and uh, the, the power in the words state of emergency, it's unfortunate that we have to use that description. Uh, I assume that's a statutory necessity to use the words state of emergency. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'll be voting on the amendment because we need to. 30 days, 60 days, doesn't matter the, the people that, this is going to change uh, how people are thinking and feeling. More discussion on the 30 day amendment, Mr. Hemel? Uh, yeah, I go to discussion this time. Supervisor there? No, um, I think we all need to remember what Crystal said that we do have the option to rescind this should we feel it's not necessary. Just because we adopt it or we vote to pull it for 60 days doesn't mean we're tied into that. We do have the option to rescind it. Supervisor Clark. Yeah, um, I think my concern is if we switch from 60 to 30, uh, we'll, be, we'll be lacking some consistency. I think that the community right now wants to see us 
probably have access to more information. I think when we're communicating with our constituents, it's probably really important to uh, convey confidence in these hired staff that we have and in our health services. Um, we bought them time. They, they're looking at how many beds we have. In order to administer these tests that we don't have, you need PPE to do that. It's that contagious. So I think we need to display confidence that we are right now in between two pretty big hotspots in Milwaukee and Brown County. So we need to be agile. We have to believe uh, in these people that we hired to do a good job and offer consistency. Is there any more discussion on 30 day? Supervisor Lachey. Yeah, could you tell us who determines what's on the agenda? Since we've been told it can be put on the agenda next month and told if we want to do it then, who actually decides what's on the agenda? Thank you. County Board Chair does have the authority of the board chair. Right, but the rest of us don't. That's what I'm getting at. You you have the sole authority to determine the agenda. Well, if it was requested, I would believe I would put it on there. And I, I believe you would too, but that doesn't right. change the fact that the actual authority Put it on the agenda lies with you. Is there any other discussion on the 30 day? I can answer the question, the agenda question. So, under Rule 2.05, um, we have any matter um, which can be presented to the clerk's office. Um, if it's desired to be placed on the agenda. So your county board chair does have the authority over the agenda, but as I understand it, there have been situations where um, a supervisor can add something to the agenda. Normally all of these things go through the committee, so this is very rare that we would have a situation where something isn't presented to the committee. Um, but certainly if your committee takes some action uh, and it, it then would be placed on the agenda through the resolution process. Is there any other discussion on the change to 30 days? Seeing none, we'll vote on that. And Supervisor Smith? No. Supervisor Gruber? Yes. Supervisor Schneider? No. Supervisor Montemayor? No. Supervisor Clark? No. Supervisor Nelson? No. Supervisor Prochek? No. Supervisor Koch? No. Supervisor Schobert? Supervisor Bauer? No. Supervisor Jorgensen? No. Supervisor Ziegelbauer? No. Supervisor Nenick? No. Supervisor Abler? No. Supervisor Kulo? No. Supervisor Dan? No. Supervisor Wagner? No. Supervisor Immel? No. Supervisor Oji? Aye. Supervisor Hoffman? No. Supervisor Hilblink? Yes. Supervisor Bosman? Supervisor Veldman? No. Supervisor Gehring? No. Supervisor Testrudy? No. Motion does not pass. And we're back to we're back to discussion on uh, uh, the resolution and the, the First Amendment, which includes the First Amendment. Supervisor Emma. Yeah, so I guess two other things I didn't bring up before. I kind of worry how this will affect future county budgeting when we look at the budget um, going forward. And then I, I think, I forgot who brought it up before, but going through the channels, if we weren't to go with the extension of the order that we would go through the different committees um, and the full county board um, to allocate those funds. Is that correct? Did we discuss that? That was an option instead of like, doesn't the declaration automatically give discretionary uh, funding to, to Adam, right? So instead of an option.
option would be to go through like the committees. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, I did make just just make that up then. Uh, I, I I I'm more uh, I would be more in favor of that option, but um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Supervisor Jargons. I just have a question, and it's kind of a point of order question. Are we now discussing the amendment, and then later discuss the actual? We're discussing the actual resolution with the original amendment. Did, did we pass the amendment? I, I mean, yes. Supervisor Nelson. Well, obviously I'm conflicted. Got more phone calls, like everyone, got more phone calls, got more emails on anything since Sunny Ridge, when we sold Sunny Ridge. Um, I think the uh, amendment to this uh, is, uh, goes a long way to clarifying it. Um, I originally, as you noted, voted no for pulling this for this very reason. I mean, where we could be perceived as cobbling out a resolution bit by bit and add this and subtract that, rather than having gone through the usual procedure of having a committee where everyone could come to the committee meeting and have their say and talk about amendments, et cetera, at that point. But that's all water over the dam. Uh, at this point, I am going to vote in favor of of, uh, of uh, this, although I am, as I say, I'm disappointed in the, in the name of it. I mean, uh, I wish we could somehow uh, uh, make it clear <coughs> to people that we, we will be dealing with recommendations unless it is a dire situation. Um, the other thing we really, really need to, uh, to uh, discuss with our constituency, uh, rather, whether through the media or what, about, again, personal responsibility. I have, a, I have a responsibility to keep myself safe. I also have a responsibility to keep my neighbors safe. And everyone has to be thinking in that frame of mind, everyone in the county. The, the, and I know it's, it's going to be difficult for businesses if they can only operate at 25% and stuff like that. And, uh, the world is changing. Supervisor uh, Hilberling mentioned that uh, my wife now, she only shops online. She shops at the grocery store online. And actually, that's a benefit because then we don't have to buy extra junk. She just buy what she, what she orders. But, but anyway, I'll be voting for it. And, uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's, in my mind, it's, it's, it's too bad that it's getting so convoluted. Supervisor OJ. Thank you. Um, it, this, I, I think the problem, the, the conflict that some of us have with this, I think everyone in here agrees that we should give guidance to, to the community on what to do. And I don't think anybody has a problem with Adam having the ability to do what he needs to do to have people in our nursing home or to have money for PPE. It's the other stuff that's stuck in there that is unclear or can possibly give power where we don't want power to be or doesn't give us any authority to determine whether it's good or bad to do something at that point. That, to me anyway, kind of overwhelms the good that, that's in this resolution. And that it's unfortunate. Uh, I would love to vote yes for half of it and no for half of it, but that's, that'd be a whole lot more amendments that we'll be here all night. <laughs> Is there any other discussion? Mr. Jorgensen. Um, first of all, I want to compliment Adam and the staff. I think what they came up with as far as these guidelines far and Adam and, and the other staff uh, with this $500,000 authorization I, I mean I'm sure it's perfect I don't have a question and I don't think I would have a question if that number were twice that big I think you know that's the, so, so that portion of the of the amendment I don't or of this document I don't have any problem with the part that I am hearing from my constituents and I'm one of these people that's well over that 65 mark there you know I'm one of these people that you know so I'm hearing from both them and issue is we have a state of emergency. We have the ability under this 15, chapter 15 in our 
something that isn't here right now. We have nobody in the hospital. And should we just keep our powder a little dry and be very willing to say yes on such a, if we get such a notice, and therefore what that would mean was just take that state of emergency out of this resolution and leave the rest of it in place. I don't think that, if I understand it right, that 252 authority in the last whereas grants any new authority, does it? It really just reflects that we support it. So again, it's just a, a, a support for our people that are doing good work. So what this leads me to is I would like to, if we could explore and hear what other people would say, but the idea of just eliminating the state of emergency and letting us come back and do that on short notice if we have to. We're not in the 1850s where we have to get in our horse and buggy and come to a meeting. <laughs> We've been doing a little better anyway. But that, that's just the thought there. But I really, overall, I compliment our staff and, and Adam in particular. Uh, these aren't easy things to even sort out as far as we got. Supervisor Prochek. Thank you, Chairman. I'm going to support the resolution as amended due to the fact that uh, my correspondence talking with business people, which I represent several in, in my district and with my residents in my district, it accomplishes basically everything that they've asked me to accomplish as a county board supervisor. Thank you to the administration and to our leadership for coming up with the, uh, the term, ter the, uh, the terms that were met, that need to be met. So the other thing being is I would like to ask that somehow maybe next month, if it's possible, we get a report on what exactly the difference is between state of emergency. I'm going to support this tonight as it is amended, but I would like to know if there actually is something that would be lost if we took that line off of a resolution. God forbid we have to do this again. Uh, someday, maybe not this particular issue, but maybe someday, 15, 20 years from now, I would like to have us clarify exactly what that state of emergency, because I do understand the context of that, because that is probably the one thing that they brought to my attention was that statement. But we have to live with that in order to move forward, and I would appreciate some clarification maybe next month. Maybe. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Supervisor Wagner. Yeah, I, I was just going to uh, say rather quickly, when I, I talked to people, I heard criticism in some instances of what the state did, and certainly in some instances of what the federal government did. But I never heard any criticism, and maybe that was just me, of what the county was doing. I think what the county has been doing, I'll be perfectly honest, and I was very involved in that, as most of you know. Uh, but it was led by Adam, our public health, uh, I thought they've done just a bang up job. I heard that here. And I think we have a 60 day track record of outstanding performance. And I have no reason to doubt that that will not continue. So I am going to strongly support it. And I appreciate that uh, Supervisor Distruti clarified it. And uh, because that was never what the intention was. And I would urge everybody else to vote for it. I truly believe it's the right thing. Thank you, Supervisor Wagner. Is there any other discussion? Supervisor Smith. Um, I just kind of want to, I want to circle back to what Supervisor Jorgensen was saying. I, I would be remiss if we didn't try to, I mean, are we open to making that kind of amendment to this resolution? Stating what I did earlier, or like we were saying earlier, just saying, can we just call, keep all the guidelines, our support for the guidelines, our support for the recommendations, are we able to keep all of that in place, remove the state of emergency context, remove the chapter 252, remove chapter 323 from Wisconsin state statute that also gives out that same type of authority outside of the county, and just state that if something happens, if we do become overrun by COVID, that we will meet and we will put in the place a resolution probably like this one, we can even just keep it on the back burner. If that's something we could amend this current resolution or establish a new resolution, to say that we support our guidelines, we support our recommendations, like we haven't for the last week, where we haven't had any orders in place, we haven't had anything, and it's been almost a week now, where all we've gone off as a community was our guidelines and our recommendations that were very well put from, from the county and from the administration. So I think that I, I would 
I would like to try and work and get towards that where we can meet on a 24-hour uh, basis to establish a state of emergency at that time. I just feel it's a little short-sighted to establish a state of emergency when there is just not an emergency present in Sheboygan County. I don't know if that would I guess it could be a motion for a new resolution. I don't have a draft. I don't have it written or anything. But I guess the motion would be, or a resolution would be, just to maintain our current. Our current. I'm sorry. A motion to this resolution. It could be a new resolution because it's not. It has to be posted on the agenda the board. Okay. So it would have to be a motion to or to change this resolution. Okay. Okay. So I would have to say. And I guess, I, I mean, how, how do we get to that point? How do we remove all that language? Do I have to cite, state every line that has it in there? Is that, and propose that as a motion? Yeah. I'm still new to this. Point of order that would still gut the existing resolution. Right. Yeah, I would suggest would just voting against the resolution. Now. All right, thank you. Yes, thank you. And then I did have the hearing. Supervisor Jarvin, sir. Just to try to make it clear and not all the commission action I think that they're worried about. Would your motion be or would it be that we just exclude delete lines 44 to 48, which is what declares the state of emergency and leave everything else in place because there I don't think there's a lot of I think we have to go back to line 40, that's where we start talking about the state of emergency language goes back to there. Excuse me, uh, out of order. Again, yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry, I didn't see you. I look upon this as something that we're probably never going to have to do. But I look upon this as something that we might have to go to war, a battle tomorrow. If you want to go to battle tomorrow, you need an experienced general at your head. And we have an administrator who has served this county for 21 years and never gone way off the ball and caused a problem for us. I support the legislation with the amendment which will serve Sheboygan County. Thank you, Supervisor Garrett. Is there any other discussion? I guess I just have one more point of clarification. I think it's a quick question. Call the question. Oh, Call the question. Call the question. What's the Is there a second to call the question? Yes. Again, just one more question. I just have a hard time, and it's a question for Crystal. I have a hard time rational, gaining rationale as how that 60 days was established. I mean, I know you say it's not directly called out here, but then why do we go to the immediate top limit? So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you through this podium. So if I, if I understood what you were saying, you were asking about the 60 days again. And, and I, I feel like this has been answered, but I'll answer it one more time. Um, that really what we're talking about here is under the state statutes, there isn't a, a timeline for a county board 
in establishing and determining the appropriate amount of time for a state of emergency. We do have those examples that we have in, in Chapter 15, the 30 days and, and the 60 days. Um, it's my opinion that with the COVID-19 situation that we don't fall into one of those categories that are, are laid out in Chapter 15. We don't have a, a tornado that went through and that it ended and now we can recover and, and move forward 60 days. We have a continuing uh, evolving situation here. And so that's my interpretation of Chapter 15. Is there any further discussion? Supervisor Jargis and I just want to sort this out because I think he's trying to say something that isn't getting addressed quite well. So therefore what I would do is propose an amendment to this resolution which would be as it's stated except the leading lines 40 through 48. That's my motion to amend. Is there a second? Second. Is there a discussion on this new motion or new amendment? Supervisor Nelson? Could someone please read that? Those lines? Starting at line 40, whereas the ratification of the proclamation declaring state of emergency extending the state of emergency in Sheboygan County will continue the powers of the county board chairperson and county administrator as set forth in county code section 15.13. Now therefore be it resolved that the Sheboygan County Board of Supervisors pursuant to Wisconsin statute 323.11 declares a state of emergency now exists within Sheboygan County in light of the continued public health threat posed by COVID-19 through July 21st, 2020, or until modified by further proclamation or action by the Sheboygan County Board. Thank you. Point of order again, that Dutch resolution that changes everything that we can't do. Yeah. Including the deadline. Is there any discussion on, on the resolution as amended originally? Hearing none, we will vote. Hearing none. Supervisor Smith? No. Supervisor Gruber? So what are we voting in here? The amendment? <laughs> resolution. The, the, the resolution as amended uh, by Mr. Distruti and this sheet of paper. Supervisor Schneider? Yes. Supervisor Montemayor? Aye. Supervisor Clark? Yes. Supervisor Nelson? Aye. Supervisor Prochek? Aye. Supervisor Koch? Aye. Supervisor Schobert? Yes. Supervisor Brower? Aye. Supervisor Jorgensen? No. Supervisor Ziegelbauer? Aye. Supervisor Nanny? Yes. Supervisor Obler? Yes. Supervisor Kulo? Yes. Supervisor Dan? Yes. Supervisor Wagner? Yes. Supervisor Immel? No. Supervisor OG? Nay. Supervisor Hoffman? Aye. Supervisor Hilbelink? No. Supervisor Bosman? Aye. Supervisor Veldman? Aye. Supervisor Gehring? Aye. Supervisor Testruti? Aye. The motion passes. We'll move on to resolution number two from Finance Committee. Regarding disallowance of Kurt's claim against Sheboygan County. That will be referred to Executive Committee. Resolution number three from Planning and Resources. Regarding approving a permanent easement for Town of Ryan Gas Main Replacement. That will be referred to Executive. Ordinance is introduced. Ordinance number one. Regarding eliminating penalty on delinquent payment of second installment of 2019 taxes. That will also go to Executive Committee. Mr. Distruti, would you help me? I move to adjourn. Mr. Nelson? 
Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah, we all agreed. <laughs> <laughs>